coming up on Theater Talk. When I told people, you know, that it's a musical <laughs> on the internment, their initial reaction is <laughs> guffaw. What? <laughs> yes. A musical on the internment? Right. Because, right. you know, we who experienced it yeah, don't uh, think of it as a laughing. But or it's not springtime for Hitler, no. <laughs> no. But music is a powerful way to hit, hit the emotions. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Saturday night. That's not a proverb. No, but should be. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And joining me again, I am so happy to say, is Jesse Green, critic from New York Magazine, to discuss one of the most powerful musicals I have seen in a very long time, Allegiance, now playing at the Long Acre Theater. We welcome the director of Allegiance, Stafford Arima, actor Telly Leong, actress Leia Salonga, and George Takei, the actor whose life inspired this musical. George, what is the story of your life that inspired this musical? Well, I uh, grew up in two U.S. internment camps. I was five years old at the time that the uh, soldiers came to our home in Los Angeles, and literally at bayoneted gunpoint, we were ordered out of our home. And this was 1942, right? 1942, yes. I just turned five years old in uh, April 20th, and it was a few weeks after that. And <clears throat> we were taken from our home to the horse stables of Santa Anita Racetrack because the camps weren't uh, finished uh, building yet. And uh, each family was assigned one horse stall. Uh, I had two siblings. Um, my baby sister was still a baby, not it not yet a year old, and my brother was a year younger. And all five of us were to sleep in this smelly horse stall. But to five-year-old me, living in that horse stall was a lot of fun because <laughs> I could smell the horses. We get to, to sleep where the horses sleep. So, it, you know, my experience is that of a child from five to eight and a half, totally different from that of my parents. How did the American government explain the relocation to your parents at the moment it was happening? It was for national security. Mm -hmm. And we happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And there was no other explanation beyond that. We were innocent American citizens. My mother was born in Sa uh, Sacramento, California. Mm -hmm. My father was a San Franciscan. We, uh, the kids were born in Los Angeles. And yet, because of our race, we were rounded up and imprisoned. And it was the most egregious violation of the Constitution because there were no charges, and therefore we had no trial. You need charges to, to challenge in order to have a trial. And uh, they took everything from us. My father says they took my business, they took our home, they took our freedom, and we had punishment. But you didn't stay in the stables the entire time. You were eventually moved. It was just a few months. Right. And when the, uh, the construction was completed, we were put, uh, put on a train and transported two-thirds of the way across the country to the swamps of uh, southeastern Arkansas. And again, that for me was a lot of fun. Uh, I caught <laughs> pollywogs in the creek and put them in uh, jars and watched them sprout legs and turn into frogs. Uh, living behind those barbed wire fences. Children are amazingly adaptable. It became routine, mm. lining up three times a day to eat lousy food in a noisy mess hall, uh, having the searchlight follow me when I made the night runs to the latrine. But to, again, five-year-old me, I thought it was kind of nice that, that they lit the way for me to pee. <laughs> but for the parents, the, the I mean, sense of betrayal to the parents is palpable. In, in watching your show. Stafford, what attracted you to this? Uh, attracted is a wrong word for something. So, uh, what brought you to, to telling this story of a, of a family 
like George's, but a different, a fictional family? There are two reasons. One is my, uh, my father and my grandmother and aunts and uncles were interned up in Canada. Mm. They did the exact same thing up in Canada. They, my, my family was from Vancouver, and they rounded up the Japanese Canadians who were on the West Coast and put them in internment camps. So there is a, a personal connection to the story that um, uh, just, just whet my appetite with regards to how to take something like this, never been told before in a Broadway musical, and share that story, this, this universal story about a multi-generational family. When I read a very early draft, I knew that this was a story that would touch many people, not just people who are from, you know, a, a Japanese, American, or Canadian, or Asian descent, but people, a human story. Yeah, because you relate to it. You think, what if this had been me, or you think about it now, I mean, suddenly you think, well, what if suddenly America were, were to say, well, we're going to round up all the Arabs now and put them in camps, that this is just as, as, as egregious back then, just as, 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 as crazy a thought. Um, Kelly, your character really has great allegiance mm -hmm. to the United States, as the title says, but what is the trajectory of what happens to him? Well, I think Sammy, represents uh, Sammy, which is a role that I share with George, represents um, the youth at the time, which, you know, when the war was happening, there were, the young people wanted to get up and do something. You know, the, the young people were the ones that wanted to sign up and enlist. And the, and the minute Pearl Harbor happened, there was this wave of patriotism that really swept the young people at the time, very much in the same way that, you know, I can think of after 9-11 mm -hmm. happened. There was this wave of patriotism that was felt across the country. And, um, and people signed up to serve. And so Sammy represented that sort of allegiance to country and to America that I think is, um, that was very prevalent at the time. And then, uh, Leah, in your character, we have a different point of view on right. the, uh, what's going on at the time. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Kay is kind of the maternal figure of the Kimura family because her mother passed away. No, that's not a spoiler alert. And she <laughs> then becomes Sammy's mother, primary mm -hmm. caregiver. However, once she goes into the camps, things change, and she falls in love with a law student named Frankie. And, and because he's a law student, he knows the Constitution, he knows the law. And his stance is, well, our constitutional rights were violated. Therefore, I refuse to be drafted. I refuse to fight unless you free us out of these camps. Then by all means, we will be as patriotic as everybody else. And the other side of that argument was that there are many Americans that felt like even though we have yes. been imprisoned, you know, Sammy's character says, if we were to volunteer to serve, then we, then, would, uh, then we would prove our loyalty to the United right. States and they would free us. We would no longer be the enemies that they view us to but be. But they didn't, did they? They, they didn't, but, yeah. you know, I mean, hindsight I mean, is 20 There were like purple hearts and awards yeah. given to the families of the 442, but they were still inside the camps when those so, posthumous So this very political argument, which was spurned from the internment, actually tore families apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It so, was this fracture that happened with this family, but symbolically also the Japanese-American community. Mm -hmm. Did it happen in your family? It, it did. Tell my us, parents were, that. Uh, when the, that loyalty questionnaire came down, my father said, this is outrageous. Now, tell about the loyalty questionnaire mm -hmm. a little more. There were two key questions. One asked, will you bear arms to defend the United States of America? And the government sent this to all the interned? Everyone over 17, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the age of 17, mm -hmm. had to respond to it, whether you were male or female, 17 or 87, immigrant or American citizen. And that question being asked of an 87-year-old immigrant mm -hmm. lady was outrageous. It's preposterous asking her to bear arms to defend the United States. But even more insidious was question 28, which was one sentence with two conflicting ideas. It asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States and forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? The word forswear assumes that there's an existing loyalty, an inborn racial loyalty to the Emperor. And so if you answered, no, I don't have a loyalty to, to the emperor to forswear, then you were saying no to the first part of the very same sentence. Do I swear my loyalty to the United States? If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, you were then confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor, and now we're ready to forswear it and repledge your loyalty to the United States, thus 
justifying the internment. It was one of those, when did you stop beating your wife mm -hmm. questions. It was outrageous, and my parents said, we will not grovel before this government. They took everything from us, and now they want our dignity. Well, when did you become aware that that was your parents' attitude? I was a child then, but when I became a teenager, um, I was inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, and I became active in the civil, uh, civil rights movement. I did a, a civil rights musical, and I met Dr. King, and that was one of the most thrilling experiences to shake his hand and share some words with him. And I couldn't rec reconcile all these ideals that the civil rights movement was fighting for with what I knew to be my childhood of imprisonment. So I had many long after-dinner conversations with my father, and I learned about our democracy from this man who lost everything in and the middle of his life. And didn't get it back. And didn't get no, it no. back. He had to start from scratch. When, we, uh, when the war ended, we came back to Los Angeles, and our first home was on Skid Row oh. in downtown L.A. How old was your father at that point? He was in his late 30s. Mm. So, you know, he has ha had every right to be embittered, and yet he told teenage me that our democracy is a people's democracy, and it can be as great as a people can be, but it is also as fallible as people are. Our democracy is vitally dependent on people who cherish our ideals and actively engage with the process. And then one Sunday afternoon, he took me downtown to the Adlai Stevenson for President headquarters. And he says, we volunteered, but he actually volunteered me. <laughs> and I, there I was with passionate people who worked so hard to get Governor Stevenson elected president. We failed, but I understood what our democracy is yeah. then. You have to be actively engaged. And, and so ever since then, I've been uh, a political activist. Leah, you, uh, of course, became a star in Miss Saigon, uh, by a musical about the, uh, the, the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. When did you learn about this internment situation in your life? When did you become Oof. aware of, 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 of the, the sort of outrage of it? I think it was when I started working on this. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't, a lot of people don't I, know about it, yeah. I know. And, and I grew up in the Philippines. Um, so I think our history focused on other things, and it wasn't really on, it wasn't really central. Like, like it wasn't American history that we were really mm -hmm. studying or recall studying, or I was just really stupid in high school. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I just, I, but, I, but I seriously did not recall this part of American history being taught. Um, so, but the more that I worked on this, the more aware I became. And then talking to people like George, who was pretty much living history with regards to the internment and, you know, having done every single reading, workshop, lab production of Allegiance, you get to know this part of American history quite Intimately. When did you start this, staff? I guess uh, six, six and a half years ago. Um, I, was well, I was, I, I was, I was, I was contacted by the producer, uh -huh. uh, Lorenzo, uh, and Jay had just met George, uh, and I received an email, and they had just asked, "Oh, would, would this be something that might interest you?" and they didn't know of my kind of personal attachment to the internment, and we jumped on board, and it's been a kind of labor of love, uh, of development over these, you know, six and a half years, and we were so blessed to have a, a wonderful production at the O Globe back in 2012. And then we had a gestation period between then and now coming to Broadway that we continue to work on the show and continue to believe in the process of developing an original musical. Stafford, I wonder why a musical? I mean, uh, where along in the process of developing George's idea uh, or the stories that he remembered from his childhood, did music come into it? And, and w what is the role that music is meant to play in a story that's uh, very political and dark? I think the greatest gift that a musical can offer is that it allows uh, a character uh, to be able to, to sing and to uh, communicate uh, through a different medium. Uh, in a play, they speak the text or it's a soliloquy or whatever else. In a musical, they get to sing it. And there is something uh, uh, 
I, I, I feel in many ways very open about the communication skills of singing and how that elevates uh, drama in a very different way, which is why everyone at this table loves musicals so much. I also think growing up in a very traditional Asian home, I'm not Japanese American, but I'm Chinese American. Um, my parents were immigrant parents. And so, you know, there is something growing up Asian that in our cultures, emotion isn't dealt with sometimes. So there's so much of that is, of that is unsaid. And all of a sudden in a musical, we get to explore all of those emotions of what is actually oh. happening in the internal life of a character mm -hmm. through music. So I think it's actually a really wonderful way to kind of see not just the history of what happened, but the humanity of what happened, what really happened internally with these people. You're saying in a way that a naturalistic treatment might not be able to explain. Yeah, because a lot, oftentimes, you know, growing up very Chinese and also knowing people that grew up in very traditional Japanese homes too, there's so much emotion that is not dealt with and not said, mm -hmm. you know, that I think it's very interesting that in a musical we can explore the emotional life of this. Well, George, when I told people, you know, that it's a musical <laughs> on the internment, their initial reaction is <laughs> guffaw. What? <laughs> yes. A musical on the internment? Right. Because, right. you know, we who experience it yeah, don't uh, think of it as a laughing But it's not springtime for Hitler, no. <laughs> no. But music is a powerful way to hit, hit the emotions. I understand that uh, the idea originated uh, when you were attending a musical. As a matter of fact, yes. Uh, in the Heights. Yes. Lynn well, what about uh, the story I've read is that you were found weeping <laughs> <laughs> during or after that show. At uh, intermission. At intermission. Uh, by well, the right before the intermission, uh, the uh, father has mm -hmm. the song Inutil, yeah. Useless. And for some odd reason, that song clicked in me and it reminded me of my father telling me about how he felt when he had to respond to the loyalty questionnaire and the, the enormity of the decision that he had to make, not just for himself, but for his three children, mm -hmm. what their future is gonna be, um, is gonna be determined by that decision that he makes. And both my parents were anguished by that, but they said that they're gonna stand down on principle and that their children will ha share that kind of strength of character. And so they decided to answer no to those two uh, questions. Um, and because of that, we were transferred to Tule Lake, oh, the uh, harsher prison camp. One of the most powerful moments in, in Allegiance, you break down sobbing. Now, from a technical standpoint, I also want to ask all of you, you recreate, I mean, I, I'm assuming you're recreating that every night. The night I saw it, your anguish was so vivid and powerful. You miss Saigon every night, completely devastated the audience with your breakdown, and you too. So I just want you each to tell me, how technically are you able to get to that place each and every performance? Well, that breakdown yes. I have is a very personal one for mm -hmm. me because as I uh, said about the uh, teenage uh, discussion I had with my father, sometimes those discussions became very intense and very heated because I was an idealistic teenager working on the civil rights movement. And in the heat of passion, I said to my father, Daddy, you led us like sheep to slaughter oh. by taking us into the internment camp. And the give and take of the conversation suddenly stopped. He was silent, and I immediately knew I had hurt him, I had touched a nerve. And that silence seemed like an eternity. And finally he said, well, maybe you're right. And he got up and went into his bedroom and closed the door. I felt terribly. I wanted to apologize, but the door was closed, so I thought, well, tomorrow morning at breakfast, I'll apologize. Tomorrow morning came and it was awkward and I didn't and I never apologize. And I used that, that, that silence after I said that has haunted me all my life. And when I say, Papa, you were my hero too. I'm thinking of my own daddy mm -hmm. and that tears at me every night. And it wallops the audience. It really does. Now, Leia, where... where Her what? singing yes. is what does it. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. She makes me yes. cry. Yes. I mean, we don't, we don't want to give, give away, but there's a... But the, when, when, you, when you get to that powerful moment, again, 
in the show where you you break down. When I finally just yeah hit the ground and yes yes. Are there times oh. technically you're not there and you have to do? <laughs> well, there there are going to be nights. I mean, it's eight shows a week, yeah. and there are going to be nights when you're either emotionally just not there, or something happens, or like a set piece is is going wrong. Or there was one night I think when a piece that I'm supposed to mess with wasn't on on him, mm -hmm. and, and I'm already and I'm thinking oh, yeah. lyrics are coming out of my mouth, <laughs> lyrics are coming out of my mouth, and I have complete eye contact. And, and my brain is, is thinking, not there. How do there. I fix this? How, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> what do I do? The gears are turning. There's, yes, and the gears are turning. I'm looking on stage. What am I going to do? And there's nobody that can save oh. me now. <laughs> um, so, we, 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 so we just have to go through the motions. And, and, life theater. And it's, it's life theater. We do it. And you try to bring yourself at least emotionally to s somewhere close enough to be able to finish the moment and... and and keep going. Well, that's your technique kicking in, yeah. It's, so that's, then that's the technique yeah. kicking in, and the technique is, is apparent every time I open my mouth to sing in order to produce the same sound on Tuesday as I do on Saturday as I would on Thursday, and that for either matinee or evening show on one day, that's the sound you'll get. My technique is always, always in play. Telly, my, my technical question for you is since you play a character whom you share with George, in, in a way, uh, you play him as a young man, mm -hmm. you play him as an older man, how much work did you do studying his mannerisms and his way of carrying himself? Well, you know, and I, how I good think, of an imitation do you I do? think, well, well <laughs> I think over five years, I've perfected quite a good I've been fertilized the ground. I think I've done, oh but, but at the no, same everybody time, everybody in this cast has we, a We all have a great choice. <laughs> <story. laughs> but you know, I, I feel like we've studied each other, actually. Like, so, I got this just Yeah, so, yeah, so it's interesting. Like, we found it together, and we'd, we'd watch each other. I'd watch him as old, when, you know, we pass the baton from the 40s to the present, I watch his performance and it informs what I do in the beginning, you know, so it's, um, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's very collaborative, I mean, the, we've been together with it now oh, for yes. five, almost six years. The three of them, plus this extraordinary group of 23 actors that we have, have really, we've, we've really created a family, and, and, there is a, and there is an energy amongst all of them that when, when, when they're up on that stage, you can feel the give, the take, the love, the, the, the support that's there. And it's, it's breathtaking to watch and to, to have been, you know, touched by the experience of working with these three incredible artists. Although, I, 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 you said you're still in previews right now as we're shooting this. And you, and you said to me before we rolled, I don't think anybody likes me very much right now. <laughs> I quickly want to say, though, that it's not all emotional breakdowns. That there's many joyful moments in Allegiance and many production numbers because you are dealing with how the people in this awful camp conditions far worse than we were ever led to believe and that's a measure of yeah. resilience you yes. know it's not just teeth gritting toughness but also the ability to find joy to find love laughter laughter, laughter. yeah Fun. and that yeah. is what made it possible to endure we use the word gamang yes. endure with dignity fortitude with pride the thing that I feel like that really moves people to tears on this show is watching this community be able to survive this and find joy in the desolate places of Wyoming where it's 30 below yeah. zero during the winters, and they're still able to find that joy. I mean, that is the part that I think really moves people. I still remember our yeah. barrack was right across from the mess hall, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, camp dance that we uh, have as a production number, uh, those dances were allowed by the, uh, the camp command for the teenagers, mm -hmm. and my mother put us to bed early, but I remember hearing mm. the sounds of the 40s, mm. the big band oh. music, you know, Andrew's sisters singing, wafting o over the night air to, to my ears, and so I still relate to the sounds of the 40s. Yeah. Well, a stunning production and visually very exciting. I mean, you, you go off to war, amazing war scene. I don't want to give anything mm -hmm. away, but there's just some, some beautiful effects to enhance, to enhance the music and the acting. A last question, Jesse. So you're saying you don't hate him? 
No, <laughs> we don't hate them at all. Don't. In fact, if, if they, you know, what I what I love is because it is a new musical, not based on a prior work. When there is a change that goes, this is going to really sharpen the story, or this is going to really help the emotional journey of these characters. Everybody, every designer, every crew person backstage, every actor goes, yes. What are we doing? And if we have to put it in in three hours, we're doing it. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's all, all heads in. You know, it's great. Yeah, all hands on deck. All hands on this. deck. Let's get in the game. Let's do it. Now at the Long Acre Theater, Allegiance, I want to thank very much. Again, George Takei, Leah Salonga, Telly Leong, and Stafford Arima. Break a leg. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse Green. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>